Welcome to The Haran Files, a channel that revives cases that have gone cold and are in desperate need of being solved. In this episode, I'll be discussing about a case that has so many insane twists and turns that by the end of it, I was just lost. I had no idea what in the world was going on. And quite frankly, this case could become a movie one day. This is the case of Clarence Roberts. On November 18, 1970, in Nashville, Indiana, Ella Cummings, a neighbor of the Roberts family, observed leaves burning at the base of a tree that was located near the barn of the Roberts' property. When Cummings saw the smoke and blaze, she immediately darted home and called the local fire department. Fifteen minutes after dialing emergency services at 6.30 p.m., a fire engine arrived at the burning barn. On arrival, they quickly note that the fire spread rapidly throughout the structure with the obvious sign that the barn was already destroyed. The fire was so hot that even the local fire department had to stand back and let the fire show signs that it was turning into ashes. Once the fire had been cooled, the firefighters made a disturbing discovery. They discovered a charred corpse on the ground. The body was so burnt that it was difficult finding out whether the body was humid. Next to the body was a half-melted loaded shotgun. The body was quickly determined to be Clarence Roberts, and the coroner, Jack Bond, initially labeled the death as a suicide and believed that he had shot himself. But Bond and the rest of Nashville will soon find some very puzzling questions when looking at the body, with some of these questions being unsolved to this day. Not looking too into this investigation, after running a few tests on the body, it was quickly assumed to be Clarence Roberts. Funeral services were conducted and the body was buried at a local cemetery. But before we dive into what the coroner found, let's take a look at what was going on in Clarence's life right before his death. Clarence Roberts was born on March 5th, 1918 in Nashville, Indiana. A lot is unknown about his early life, but after hours of research, I was able to uncover a few things about him. He married his girlfriend Geneva in 1941 and helped raise four children. He then served in World War II. After the war, Roberts returned home to his wife and the pair continued to live in Nashville. The Roberts family, especially Clarence, were very well known in their community. In 1950, Clarence ran for county sheriff and easily won. Clarence also attained 33rd degree status by the Masonic Lodge. Now, if you're gonna ask me what that is, I have no idea what this is. Even like pronouncing the award 33rd degree status was just so unnatural for me to say. But when I first heard the name, I thought it was just some kind of military status. But what I found through my research, this award is given to those who had made major contributions to society through the eyes of the Masonic Lodge. Clarence Roberts was only one of three men in the entire country to attain this award and was given a Masonic ring. During that time, Clarence owned a local hardware store with his brother, Carson Roberts. Carson described Clarence as someone that would be everyone's best friend. He was someone that was well-respected and was very outgoing. His nephew, Bob White, described him as a very helpful person and would help anyone that was in need. Clarence was clearly living the American dream, having grown in the ranks of society and was able to raise his wife Geneva from rags to riches, he and Geneva were viewed as the perfect couple. Clarence had successfully raised a family and he had a successful family business. I mean, in the 1960s, come on now, what better could you do? Am I right, guys? Guys? Anyways, even though Clarence's rank and status were on the rise, it started to consume him. According to those that were close to him, his persona began to change dramatically. 
He purchased three luxury cars and an expensive home, and not to throw Clarence under the bus, but I figured out where that house is at. It's at the intersection, if you're in Nashville, Indiana, it's at the intersection of Road 135 and Grandma Barnes Road. I mean, come on now. It's next to a road named after Grandma. They gotta have good food over there. Come on now. His sister-in-law, Mrs. Warren Roberts, described that this change in Clarence's persona was like, in quote, turning a light on and turning a light off. Along with this, his financial decisions were beginning to send him into heavy debt as his businesses could not support him. In a desperate attempt to stay afloat, he decided after working with his brother for 22 years to sell the hardware store and decided to put everything on two property investments. These investments included an apartment building and several grain elevators. To point out how much Clarence was risking himself, he was either going to be a millionaire or be broke, and the latter pursued when his property investments failed. By the fall of 1970, it looked like Clarence's situation was getting incredibly worse. A month before the fire in October of 1970, Sheriff Warren Roberts, Clarence's own brother, just gotta put that out there, not to throw you under the bus or anything, but it's just crazy what you did, literally repossessed not one, but two of his three luxury vehicles. Clarence and Geneva were left abandoned and were running out of ideas. Some of Clarence's relatives, including his own nephew, Bob White, believed that Clarence at the time was getting desperate and suicidal. Now, I know you guys want to continue on what was going on in Clarence's life right before his death, but we need to put a pause on that. I know it looks crazy with the change of persona, changing the lifestyle, and the alleged suicidal thoughts, but we need to focus on something that's more important. We need to focus on the autopsy. Dr. Benz, who performed the autopsy, tried to find any sign of bullet wounds, but he didn't find any. What's even more puzzling was that there was no sign of any gunshot residue on the scene. What's even more baffling? The cause of death of the body. Dr. Benz found a substantial absence of carbonous material and a substantial absence of internal burning of the respiratory tract. This means that the body was dead before the fire had begun. Dr. Benz also found that there was a presence of 80 to 86% of carbon monoxide in the blood. Just in case you didn't know, the smoke and fire is not carbon monoxide, but rather a mixture of, yes, there is some carbon monoxide in there, but it also has carbon dioxide, and it also has particular matter, such as soot or ash. This strong presence of carbon monoxide in the bloodstream led to Dr. Benz to determine that the person died from carbon monoxide intoxication prior to the fire. This is the first thing that initially baffles detectives. What killed Clarence? If it was a suicide, why was there no bullet wounds, bullets, or even gunshot residue near the body? And why was he dead before the fire began? This is what leads detectives to believe that the body was a setup with the garnish of a gun to give off the impression that Clarence had killed himself. But did the body really belong to Clarence? Dr. Benz deemed that the definite identification of the body is impossible to be determined. When comparing x-rays from Clarence Roberts' medical records with the x-rays taken from the body, some interesting results were found. For example, a tooth discovered near the body was identified as a lower right second molar. The thing is, Clarence had that specific tooth removed several years before the fire. The most damning evidence being that Clarence's blood type is type B, whereas the blood type of the body was type AB, therefore proving that the body could not possibly have belonged to Clarence. To add more fuel to the fire, remember how Clarence had won that prestigious Masonic ring? Well, when Detective Donald Cooster sifted through the ashes of the fire, he found Clarence's Masonic ring, buried just several inches above the surface, not too far, but pretty far that you wouldn't have noticed it. And what's interesting is that this ring was virtually undamaged. Detective Cooster said in quote, the ring when it was found was in excellent shape. The ring definitely had no damage with it as far as melting or as anything on it. There's no way that ring could have withstood a heat of that fire like it did and not even have a damaged part on it at all. I definitely think that the ring was planted. It had to be, it had to be. Okay, so the body was in Clarence's, then who else could it have been? Well, just a day before the fire on November 17th, Roberts was spotted in the early afternoon in Morgantown, a town that's roughly 11 miles north of Nashville, not too far away, so pretty reasonable to travel to, to, you know, visit some friends or an acquaintance or something. Which is perfect because people who were acquainted with Roberts saw him accompanied by a man who was not known by Roberts' friends. 
The man was described as looking around the same age or maybe a little bit older than Roberts and was among the same size as him, approximately like five foot seven to five foot nine inches tall. This man was wearing a dirty brown plaid shirt. Roberts told the acquaintances that he had befriended a vagrant and was overheard talking about the vagrant coming over to Roberts' house to cut some grass. It was observed that Roberts did not even know the vagrant's name, but was open to giving him a ride to his house. What's disturbing about this encounter was that while Roberts and the man were walking to his car, the man collapsed and was caused by some unknown occurrence. Roberts insisted that he would take the individual to the hospital. Well, when police checked records after Roberts had passed away, um, within a 300 mile radius, they found no reports of a man of that description being admitted to a hospital. This already begins to paint a dark picture for Roberts and divided the community of Nashville on what happened to Clarence Roberts. Some believed that he had killed himself, while others believed that he had murdered the vagrant in order to receive the insurance money. In regard to the first theory, there was a major question that was present since the beginning. If Clarence had committed suicide, how would he have been able to light the barn on fire? And if he were able to, why would he even do it? Momentum further began to back up the second theory when it was found that a witness named John Kennedy, who also thoroughly studied the photographs of the fire, the rubble, and examined the bones from the body, concluded that the area where the body was found was saturated with flammable liquids, which would explain why the fire erupted in such intensity and speed. Kennedy also expressed the opinion that the body itself was also soaked in these liquids and was burned after the limbs had been removed. Now, when I first read this, Everything added up except for the part that the limbs had been removed. But after doing some extra research, it was confirmed that the body was found without limbs, therefore making this theory extremely likely. What makes Roberts look even more suspicious was that the body had partial remains of a brown plaid shirt, the very same kind of clothing that the vagrant was seen wearing. To put the cherry on top, it was confirmed that Clarence Roberts had purchased several life insurance policies that totaled up to $1 million. $1 million, that is crazy to me. Like, that's crazy to think. I mean, I get having a life insurance policy, but how are you able to put $1 million into it? Like, that's just crazy to me. And that rate, just give me all of it, bruh. Give me all the money, because I think I need it. If not, well, I guess my future in Squid Game could work. But anyways, let's now look at what Clarence Roberts was doing on November 18th, 1970, before the fire had happened. Early in the afternoon, a bank officer went to the home of Clarence Roberts. He wanted to discuss with Roberts about a note on which the bank suspected him that he had forged the signature of his brother, Carson. Roberts was well aware of the bank's suspicions and ignored the knock on the door. Surprisingly, like, I'm surprised the bank officer didn't, you know, call the police or, like, had a warrant or anything because I don't think you could just ignore the front door like that. I don't know. I feel like you could get, like, arrested for doing that. But hey, it's 1970, so I guess you can do whatever you want. Later on in the afternoon, after the bank officer had left, Charles Roberts, Clarence's cousin, saw Clarence mulching leaves on his property. Charles talked with Clarence briefly. Clarence told Charles that his wife Geneva and son Lauren had gone to Columbus for dinner. He then invited Charles to join him for a sandwich, but Charles declined the invitation. Only 15 minutes after he had left Roberts' home, he was notified that there was a fire on Clarence's property. This made Charles Loki the last person to have seen Clarence Roberts alive. Well, Come on now, alive. Well, anyways, Charles told the authorities that Clarence was wearing a solid blue shirt. Now, I just want to go back to the fact that the fire had started literally minutes after Charles Roberts had left. I'm absolutely bone chilled by this. Not only is it super eerie that Charles was within minutes of being involved with an unsolved mystery, but remember Ella Cummings, the person who called the fire department? Well, from her point of view, she didn't see the barn on fire. She only saw the leaves on the base of the barn burning. She didn't even actually see flames. She saw smoke. And come on now, when there's smoke, there's fire. Like, I mean, you put two and two together and quite frankly, she was right and she called the fire department. But anyways, it makes one wonder, was Clarence Roberts setting up a fire starter? If he were, authorities believe that he would have been watching his barn burn from the woods. 
This is the part that's bone chilling because that means Ella Cummings was likely being stalked by Roberts from the woods like a freaking scene out of Halloween with Michael Myers stalking Laura Strode. It's also very important to note that the clothing on the body did not even match Clarence's Roberts solid blue shirt that Charles saw Clarence wearing literally minutes before the fire started. I mean, explain that to me. That doesn't make sense at all. It makes that Halloween scene more likely to have happened. Honestly, John Carpenter could have probably been in the area and freaking saw that scene and he was like, that's perfect. That's so perfect for my film. And went back to Illinois. Like, bro, that's crazy to me. Now, I know you all are thinking that Clarence Roberts is super sus and we should vote him out, but we gotta be open-minded because when you're in the true crime world, anything's possible. You could think one thing, like literally all the evidence is pointing one thing, and what actually happened is literally the polar opposite of what you were thinking. And we have to further look on why a significant chunk of the Nashville community, including Indiana State pathologist Dr. John Pless, believed that Clarence Roberts had died in the fire. According to Clarence's wife, Geneva Roberts, the body was Clarence. She and many other members of the community believe that Clarence would have been in the mindset of committing suicide. Just a few months before the fire in June of 1970, Clarence Roberts hinted of suicide during a conversation with his attorney. Later on, just two weeks before the fire on November 3rd, he told a second attorney in quote, my widow will be the richest one in Brown County. To add on to this, they believe that Clarence shot himself and because of that, he might have accidentally set the barn on fire. Roberts was known for keeping gasoline for his lawnmower in the barn. The gasoline, regardless of any of the theories that we've discussed it, does explain the rapid burning of the barn and backs up Kennedy's belief that flammable liquids were used in the fire. In terms of the blood type, dental findings, and clothing, those do not match. Military records were the source for identifying Clarence's blood type because, you know, he served in World War II, I mean, why not? The Roberts challenged the reliability of the blood typing and also suggested that military records were frequently inaccurate. The family and many witnesses insisted that the tooth that was found was not a second molar, but rather a first molar, a tooth that Clarence had. What's suspicious about the dental findings was that detectives only found the singular tooth and did not find any of the other teeth, which really doesn't make sense to me. This may paint a solid finding for Geneva, but here's what counters her argument. Regardless of whether the tooth had distorted during the fire and took the shape of another tooth, you can't miss the fact that the blood type was different. When researching on the reliability of military records during World War II, I didn't find anything that suggested that blood test records during that time were off in any way at all. I mean, I found no evidence that they were off. Plus, going back to the suicide theory, best believe I'm about to tear that theory into shreds. First of all, the coroner found no evidence of gunshot wounds on the body. Secondly, when studying the position of the gun on the body, it was laying over the body. That just doesn't make sense for a gunshot to occur because if you think about it in a physical way, when you shoot a gun, there's there's a recoil force. That gun should have shot back. Because of Noon's third law, you know, when a force is in action, there's an equal and opposite reaction because, you know, that's how the recoil force works. But anyways, enough of the physics terms. Basically, the gun should have been at least a few feet away from the body, not on top of it. And going to the theory with the gasoline, Clarence could have just easily doused the body in the barn. And to add on to this, the clothing did not match Clarence and matched the vagrant to whom could have easily been drugged and then murdered by Clarence. To put the cherry on top, Clarence was legit spotted mulching leaves only a few minutes before Cummings saw them on fire. Explain that to me. Explain that to me. I mean, no cap, no if, thens, or buts about it. Explain that to me because that just doesn't add up. If Clarence died in the first fire, that is the biggest coincidence that I've ever heard of. Now, the second theory sounds very intriguing, but how did the victim die? Remember when the coroner said the cause of death was carbon monoxide? Well, in December of that year, the bank repossessed Clarence Roberts' pickup truck. Important thing to note now was that during the fire, there were several vehicles that were parked in the east portion of the barn. The fire was so hot that every vehicle was destroyed, except for Clarence's pickup truck. The only reason why Clarence's pickup truck wasn't destroyed was because his vehicle was saved by neighbors and passerby who came in to recover it before it was too late. Why is this important? 
Well, these people might have saved a part of the crime scene that would have been destroyed. The bank found a massive leakage of fumes that traveled into the cab of the truck. After an inspection, it was revealed that at least 30 holes were driven into the exhaust system. These holes were made by either a hammer or a punch. This strange finding would make sense in playing a major role in the death of the victim. But here's the thing, who was the victim? I mean, we know it's very likely the vagrant, but we can't prove or confirm that because we just don't know who the body is, nor if we do know that was the vagrant, we don't know who their name is. And as you can tell, a list of perplexing questions are beginning to explode. This is what caused the body to be exhumed on December 21st, 1970. Unfortunately, in 1970, there wasn't enough evidence to prove whether or not Clarence Roberts died from the fire. Intense heat from the fire damaged any evidence on what truly happened to the body or proving the true identity of the body, and the case began to get cold. With Clarence Roberts either being missing or dead, Geneva Roberts was left alone. Her net worth changed drastically from riches to rags. Financial struggles impacted her so bad that she was forced to move to the outskirts of town. She later became a cook for a local kitchen in order to make ends meet. Over the years, Geneva maintained the belief that Clarence died in the fire. Geneva wasn't alone though. As mentioned previously, renowned pathologist Dr. John Pless was convinced that it was Clarence who died. He was so convinced that he was actually able to convince others that Clarence actually died. And you're probably wondering, how was he able to reach this conclusion when there's so much evidence that points towards the body not being Clarence? Well, first of all, there was no definitive evidence that Clarence was still alive because ever since the fire, Clarence was never seen or heard from again. In an interview with Unsolved Mysteries in the late 80s, it was shockingly revealed that Dr. Plus had no idea that this evidence had existed until he was informed in 1978, eight years after the barn was set ablaze. Because of this lack of sharing evidence, Clarence Roberts was publicly ruled as dead and the body returned to a grave marked under his name. Now, despite all of the support behind Geneva's back, the insurance companies were not having it. When told that the identification of the body was deemed impossible, they were instantly suspicious of the whole event and smelled insurance fraud. Throughout the 1970s, they kept denying any of Geneva's attempts to, of getting the insurance money. This repeated denial took a toll on Geneva. She began to withdraw from her friends and neighbors. Being that Nashville was a small town with a population of around 700 people, it didn't take long for Geneva to become the center of gossip and rumors. Even though these are small town rumors, they begin to make Geneva look very, very suspicious. In April of 1972, Donald Barrett of Barrett's Tavern in Mentone, Indiana, claimed to have seen Clarence Roberts and a woman who was in Geneva. Barrett explains that he had seen Clarence and this mysterious woman at least 20 times before the fire. Seeing Roberts was a complete shock to Barrett. It's unknown if Barrett talked to this alleged Clarence Roberts. After this, several more of Roberts' acquaintances began to testify that they saw Roberts in 1974 and in 1975. During that time, local shopkeepers said to have sold large quantities of beer to Geneva. This is really weird for three reasons. Number one, Geneva was already struggling financially, so why would she buy large stocks of beer? Number two, Geneva was a diabetic, so in terms of health, she couldn't have possibly been able to drink all of that beer. And number three, Geneva doesn't even drink beer, so why is she all of a sudden drinking beer in huge quantities? Then, many neighbors began to report seeing a man on the property of Geneva Roberts' home. Detective Dave Anderson of Indiana State Police said that his station had received, in quote, a man being seen behind Geneva's residence. The man acted very strangely and would not let anyone get close to him and he would always seem to back away and head towards the house immediately. Detective Anderson then decided to set up a surveillance around Geneva's home for three days and three nights. They were photographing everyone coming and going in Geneva's house. This surveillance came up with no conclusions. Detective Anderson said in quote, I'm sure that was probably Clarence. I think he had perhaps run out of places to go and he had come back to staying with Geneva. He was the mysterious man behind her house. 
While detectives were investigating Geneva Roberts, a local reporter of the Brown County Democrat, a weekly newspaper based in Nashville, Indiana, had decided to look into the local mystery. Her name was Helen Ayers, and she had befriended Geneva in order to investigate her. She had a hunch that Geneva was hiding something from the authorities, and she had a bigger hunch that she was hiding someone in her home. Ayers had the ability to interview Geneva up to four to five times on her property. Now, Geneva Roberts was friendly to Ayers. However, she was not transparent with her. It was a common courtesy at that time for the homeowner to invite their guests into their home. For some reason, Geneva never invited her into her home and would just talk to her on her back porch. This stuck out as a sore thumb and confirmed to Ayers that Geneva was hiding someone in her home. And when she interviewed Clarence's sister, who was living on a neighboring property, Ayers said, in quote, she could hear Geneva talking to this man. And she said it definitely was not Clarence's voice. Unfortunately, it's unknown who the strange man was. It could have been Clarence, but why would his own sister doubt that it was him? Maybe his sister was in on it. Maybe Clarence changed his voice in order to sound different. Without any solid evidence, the status of Clarence is beginning to become more and more blurry. After being repeatedly denied the insurance money, Geneva took the Wabash Life Insurance Company, the company where Clarence had purchased his life insurance from, to court. On October 15, 1980, in the ruling of Roberts v. Wabash Life Insurance Company, the Court of Appeals of Indiana, 1st District, ruled in favor of the insurance companies. This shattered Geneva Roberts from being able to have any chance of winning any insurance money from the death of Clarence Roberts. Dr. Plus, who had testified for Roberts, was disappointed and explained that the courtroom was emotionally distraught after hearing the final verdict. Geneva continued on in her isolated and uneventful lifestyle until a month after the final verdict. Exactly 10 years after the Roberts' barn was caught on fire on November 1980, Geneva Roberts' home was caught on fire. When firefighters were on scene, the intensity of the fire was super strong. Having a strong opinion that Geneva was still in the house, they tried to put down the fire as quickly as possible. Unfortunately, the fire was too strong and the house had collapsed. Once the fire was finally put out, many detectives, including Detective Anderson, including Detective Anderson, were too curious and wanted to search the scene as soon as possible. After sifting through the ashes, searchers found the lifeless body of Geneva Roberts. After transferring the body to a funeral home, searchers wanted to look over the rest of the house in order to find out what had happened to Geneva. After a few hours, they uncovered a shocking discovery. Another dead body. This body was quickly sent to autopsy where it was quickly determined that the body was that of Clarence Roberts. His body was found in a different portion of uh, Geneva's house, but are we just going to ignore the fact that we found this dude's body twice, exactly 10 years apart? I mean... What is going on in Nashville, Indiana? Explain that to me. But anyways, yay, the case is closed, right? We know he didn't die in the first fire. Well, we're actually not even close to being done with the story. According to Detective Anderson, who was the one who set up the surveillance around Geneva's house, um, in quote, this might be coming to an end, but little did I know is that it was just getting started. Unlike the first fire, this fire was clearly a case of arson. It was then found that the fire traveled on a path from a point outside of the house, then it traveled through the back door and down the hallway into a room where Clarence's body was found. The fire then traveled into an adjacent room where Geneva's body was, and the path ended on Geneva's bed where her body was found. Because of these findings, a shocking discovery was made. Geneva Roberts had been murdered. It was quickly determined that turpentine, which is a highly flammable oil, was poured along this path in order for the fire to pursue that route. If you don't know what turpentine is, then you're in for some learning. Basically, turpentine oil is made of resin of a certain pine tree. If you don't know what resin is, it's similar to sap, except it is used as a way for the tree to heal itself. You know the sticky yellow substance that appears on the side of trees? Yeah, it's made from that stuff. The National Fire Protection Association labels turpentine oil as extremely flammable. In fact, turpentine oil is so flammable that it has to be completely dry in order for it to be non-flammable. And when I say completely, I mean 100% of the turpentine oil has to be dry in order for it to be non-flammable. Let me repeat it, 100%. 99.9% that those Clorox brands say ain't gonna cut it. 
After researching what the substance was, I just thought it was super interesting, to me at least, that the killer used such a powerful fire starter. It shows that the killer must have been trying to hide something, and this was most definitely a crime of passion. It's unknown who started it. It could have been Clarence, or it could have been someone of a third party. Clarence Roberts has not been ruled out as the killer, nor has he been ruled out as the victim. In the end, the second fire sent shock waves across Nashville as they learned that Geneva Roberts had been murdered. The magnitude of the shock waves was so great that it ultimately was the key towards convincing Dr. Pless that Clarence Roberts did survive the first fire and died in the second fire. According to Detective Anderson, he personally believes that the fire was caused by a third party and that Clarence was murdered in the second fire. This case is very interesting and there are too many unanswered questions. Who was the vagrant to whom mysteriously collapsed next to Clarence's car? Was he the victim of the first fire? Who was the mysterious man to whom Geneva Roberts was trying to hide? And why was she trying to hide him? Did Geneva and another man fall victim to Clarence's selfish game after not acquiring the life insurance money? Was it possible that both Clarence and Geneva had been murdered by a third party? Could it have been a murder-suicide plot by Clarence Roberts? The biggest question of them all is whether or not Clarence Roberts is still alive. As of today, after around 40 years, the case still remains unsolved. Hopefully one day though, they do a DNA test on both bodies, because to my knowledge, to my research, I didn't find any evidence that they did. And if they do, this would literally determine whether or not Clarence was still alive. But hey, at least, I don't know, just a suggestion. Thank you guys so much for enjoying episode one of The Haran Files. I've been wanting to do this for so long, and it's just incredible that I'm able to release episode one to you guys. I'll be releasing episodes every Monday, and next episode, we're going to have a special guest, local celebrity Sylvia Fialta. I know, I know, crazy. Make sure you guys subscribe so you can be in tune for that episode. And yeah, thank you so much, guys, for watching. I appreciate you guys so much, and hopefully I see you guys in the next video. Bye, guys.